his name. What do you want to do tonight? Same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. Enclosed herewith, I hand you part four. Now this part will show you why what you think or do or feel is an indication of what you are. Thought is energy and energy is power and it is because all the religions, sciences and philosophies with which the world has heretofore been familiar have been based upon the manifestation of this energy instead of the energy itself that the world has been limited to effects while causes have been ignored or misunderstood. For this reason we have God and the devil in religion, positive and negative in science, and good and bad in philosophy. The master key reverses the process. It is interested only in cause, and the letters received from students tell a marvelous story. They indicate conclusively that students are finding the cause, whereby they may secure for themselves health, harmony, abundance, and whatever else may be necessary for their welfare and happiness. Life is expressive and it is our business to express ourselves harmoniously and constructively. Sorrow, misery, unhappiness, disease and poverty are not necessities and we are constantly eliminating them. But this process of eliminating consists in rising above and beyond limitation of any kind. He who has strengthened and purified his thought need not concern himself about microbes. And he who has come into an understanding of the law of abundance will go at once to the source of supply it is thus that fate, fortune, and destiny will be controlled as readily as a captain controls his ship or an engineer his train. And now part four. The eye of you is not the physical body that is simply an instrument which the eye uses to carry out its purposes. The eye cannot be the mind, for the mind is simply another instrument which the eye uses with which to think, reason, and plan. The eye must be something which controls and directs both the body and the mind, something which determines what they shall do and how they shall act. When you come into a realization of the true nature of this eye, you will enjoy a sense of power which you have never before known. Your personality is made up of countless individual characteristics, peculiarities, habits, and traits of character. These are the results of your former method of thinking, but they have nothing to do with the real I. When you say, I think, the eye tells the mind what it shall think. When you say, I go, the eye tells the physical body where it shall go. The real nature of this eye is spiritual, and it is the source of the real power which comes to men and women when they come into a realization of their own true nature. The greatest and most marvelous power which this eye has been given is the power to think, but few people know how to think constructively or correctly. Consequently, they achieve only indifferent results. Most people allow their thoughts to dwell on selfish purposes, the inevitable result of an infantile mind. When a mind becomes mature, it understands that the germ of defeat is in every selfish thought. The trained mind knows that every transaction must benefit every person who is in any way connected with the transaction, and any attempt to profit by the weakness, ignorance, or necessity of another will inevitably operate to his disadvantage. Now this is because the individual is a part of the universal. A part cannot antagonize any other part, but on the contrary, the welfare of each part depends upon a recognition of the interest of the whole. Those who recognize this principle have a great advantage in the affairs of life. They do not wear themselves out. They can eliminate vagrant thoughts with facility. They can readily concentrate to the highest possible degree on any subject. They do not waste time or money upon objects which can be of no possible benefit to them. Now if you cannot do these things, it's because you have thus far not made the necessary effort. Now is the time to make the effort. The result will be exactly in proportion to the effort expended. One of the strongest affirmations which you can use for this purpose of strengthening the will and realizing your power to accomplish is, quote, I can be what I will to be, end quote. Every time you repeat it, realize who and what this I is. Try to come into a thorough understanding of the true nature of the I. If you do, you will become invincible. That is provided that your objects and purposes are constructive and are therefore in harmony with the creative principle of the universe. If you make use of this affirmation, use it continuously night and morning and as often during the day as you think of it and continue to do so until it becomes a part of you. In other words, form the habit. 
Unless you do this, you'd better not start at all because modern psychology tells us that when we start something and do not complete it, or make a resolution and do not keep it, we are forming the habit of failure, absolute ignominious failure. If you do not intend to do a thing, do not start it. If you start, see it through, even if the heavens fall. If you make up your mind to do something, do it. Let nothing or no one interfere with the I that you have determined. The thing is settled, the die is cast, and there is no longer any argument. If you carry out this idea, beginning with small things which you know you can control, and gradually increase the effort, but never under any circumstance allowing your I to be overruled, you will find that you can eventually control yourself, and many men and women have found to their sorrow that it is easier to control a kingdom than to control themselves. But when you've learned to control yourself, you would have found the world within which controls the world without. You will have become irresistible. Men and things will respond to your every wish without any apparent effort on your part. This is not so strange or impossible as it may appear when you remember that the world within is controlled by the I, and that this I is a part or one with the infinite I, which is the universal energy or spirit, usually called God. This is not a mere statement of theory made for the purpose of confirming or establishing an idea, but it is a fact which has been accepted by the best religious thought as well as the best scientific thought. Herbert Spender said, I quote, Amid all the mysteries by which we are surrounded, nothing is more certain than that we are ever in the presence of an infinite and eternal energy from which all things proceed." End quote. Lyman Abbott, in an address delivered before the alumni of Bangor Theological Seminary, said, quote, We are coming to think of God as dwelling in man rather than as operating on men. Science goes a little way in its search and then stops. Science finds the ever-present eternal energy, but religion finds the power behind this energy and it locates it within man. But this is by no means a new discovery. The Bible says exactly the same thing, and the language is just as plain and convincing. It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of the living God? Here then is the secret of the wonderful creative power of the world within. Here is the secret of power, of mastery. To overcome does not mean to go without things. Self-denial is not success. We cannot give unless we get. We cannot be helpful unless we're strong. The infinite is not bankrupt, and we who are the representatives of infinite power should not be bankrupts either. And if we wish to be of service to others, we must have power and more power, but to get it, we must give it. We must be of service. The more we give, the more we shall get. We must become a channel whereby the universal can express activity. The universal is constantly seeking to express itself, to be of service, and it seeks the channel whereby it can find the greatest activity where it can do the most good where it can be of the greatest service to mankind. The universal cannot express through you as long as you're busy with your plans, your own purposes. Quiet the senses, seek inspiration, focus the mental activity on the within. Dwell in the consciousness of your unity with omnipotence. Still water runs deep. Contemplate the multitudinous opportunities to which you have spiritual access by the omnipresence of power. Visualize the events, circumstances, and conditions which these spiritual connections may assist in manifesting. Realize the fact that the essence and soul of all things is spiritual and that the spiritual is the real because it is the life of all there is. When the spirit is gone, the life is gone. It is dead. It has ceased to exist. These mental activities pertain to the world within, to the world of cause and conditions and circumstances which result are the effect. It is thus that you become a creator. Now this is important work and the higher, loftier, grander and more noble ideals which you can conceive, the more important the work will become. Overwork or overplay or over bodily activity of any kind produces conditions of mental apathy and also stagnation which makes it impossible to do the more important work which results in a realization of conscious power. We should therefore seek the silence frequently. Power comes through repose. It is in the silence that we can be still, and when we are still, we can think, and thought is the secret of all attainment. Thought is a mode of motion and is carried by the law of vibration, the same as light or electricity. It is given vitality by the emotions through the law of love. It takes form and expression by the law of growth. It is a product of the spiritual eye, hence its divine spiritual and creative nature. 
From this, it is evident that in order to express power, abundance, or any other constructive purpose, the emotions must be called upon to give feeling. How may this purpose be accomplished? This is the vital point. How may we develop the faith, the courage, and the feeling which will result in accomplishment? The reply is by exercise. Mental strength is secured in exactly the same way that physical strength is secured by exercise. We think something, perhaps with difficulty the first time. We think the same thing again, and it becomes easier this time. We think it again and again. It then becomes a mental habit. We continue to think the same thing. Finally, it becomes automatic. We can no longer help thinking this thing that we are now positive of what we think. There is no longer any doubt about it. We are sure that we know. Last week, I asked you to relax, to let go physically. This week, I'm going to ask you to let go mentally. If you practice the exercise given you last week, 15 or 20 minutes a day, in accordance with the instructions, you can no doubt relax physically. And anyone who cannot consciously do this quickly and completely is not a master of himself. He has not obtained freedom. He is still a slave to conditions. But I shall assume that you've mastered the exercise and are ready to take the next step, which is mental freedom. Now this week, after taking your usual position, remove all tension by completely relaxing. Then mentally let go of all adverse conditions, like hatred, anger, worry, jealousy, envy, sorrow, trouble, or disappointment of any kind. You might say that you cannot let go of these things, but you can. You can do so by mentally determining to do so by voluntary intention and persistence. The reason that some cannot do this is because they allow themselves to be controlled by the emotions instead of by their intellect. But those who will be guided by the intellect will gain the victory. You will not succeed the first time you try, but practice makes perfect. In this, as in everything else, you must succeed in dismissing, eliminating, and completely destroying these negative and destructive thoughts, because they are the seed which is constantly germinating into discordant conditions of every conceivable kind and description. There is nothing truer than that the quality of thought which we entertain correlates certain externals in the outside world. This is the law from which there is no escape. And it is the law, this correlative of the thought with its object, that from time immemorial has led the people to believe in special providence.